So these past few weeks, I don't know if you picked up on this, it was a little subtle, but we've been going through the marks of discipleship. All throughout the chapter 10 of the Gospel of Mark, we've been hearing Jesus revealing to us little by little each Sunday what it means to be a disciple and how to follow Jesus as a disciple. First, a few weeks ago, we heard this revolutionary teaching that Jesus gave about marriage, about marriage and divorce. The, merit, the, the family life is the key, is the leaven to unlocking uh, the holiness and the sanctity of the world. The marriage is it's much more than what Moses allowed uh, for the Israelites in the Old Testament, but it's a one flesh union, that it is through marriage and through family life that God himself is imaged through this one flesh union. And that's how the world will be saved, through holy families. And then Jesus brings us also, again, another revolutionary teaching that made so many struggle, saying that if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to become like these little children. Not that you become childish and immature, but you become childlike. Imitating children as they run with reckless abandon to their father. Right? They, they run to their father asking, knowing that he will provide for them, that he will protect them. And that is how we are to act with our Heavenly Father as disciples, that we are supposed to run to him with reckless abandon. Last week, we also heard about the rich young man who came to Jesus saying, you know, Master, I've, I've, I've obeyed all the commandments. I've fulfilled the law. What must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus tells him something that makes him go away sad. He says, sell all that you have and then come and follow me. Right? We know that he was sad because he had many possessions and he loved them and he didn't want to depart from them. But through that, Jesus is teaching us that, we, that whatever, uh, whatever attachments that we have that hinder our following him completely, we need to rid ourselves of those. That we need to detach ourselves from worship of power, of wealth, of pleasure in order to follow Jesus. And then again today, we get another teaching. We get another teaching about the cost of discipleship, the cost of following Jesus. But I don't know if you noticed, we skipped again a few verses, which are kind of important. The lectionary left them out for whatever reason. Once, one day, you want to ask Pope Francis why the lectionary leaves certain things out and uh, not others. But anyway, that's beyond my pay grade. Um, but I just want to go back. If you have your Bibles with you, it's important. Context is important, right? Because it sets us up to understand this really boneheaded question that James and John ask of Jesus today. So chapter 10, verse 32. They were on the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed them were afraid. Taking the twelve aside again, he began to tell them, what was going to happen to him. Behold, Jesus says, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, spit upon him, scourge him, and put him to death. But after three days, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Right? That's a little, that's jarring. Jesus just got done telling them, I'm going to suffer. That I've been with you for these, you know, three years. You've seen me do all these miracles. You've seen me feed these multitudes of people. People have been healed, have been risen from the dead. And this is going to culminate in my death. So buckle up. And they weren't listening. They weren't listening. Because they were still falling into this idea that the Messiah, the one, the anointed one sent by the Father, was going to be this new ruler. He was going to uh, uproot the, the Romans that, that had been persecuting the Jewish people. The Jewish people had been under the, the power of so many different foreign entities. And so they were longing for this freedom. They were longing for, uh, for restoration of their land. And so they see Jesus, and they see him doing all these great things, and they're like, finally, this is the guy. He's going to establish a throne and sit upon his throne in glory. And we were the first ones. James and John were the very first ones that he called, according to the Gospel of Mark. So we're definitely going to be 
high up in his court, right? We, we're going to have this royal authority. We're going to have power again, right? And I could just see this playing out in their minds that as Jesus is telling them that he's going to suffer and die, they're not even listening. They're just thinking about what they're going to do, right? But ultimately, we know in Jesus' reply that his throne will not be a throne in a castle or in a, where do kings sit? I don't know, in a th- throne room, <laughs> in a palace, but his throne that he will ascend is the wood of the cross. And that to sit at his right and his left, ultimately we know who were at the right and the left of Jesus, but the the two thieves on the cross next to him. But James and John, they, they are seeking this false sense of glory, right? They think glory in the sense that we even fall into understanding glory nowadays, Right, the big five, power, pleasure, honor, wealth, even safety and security. That we all fall into that trap of, of thinking that's, that's going to make me happy. Right? If only I had more power, if I had more money, then I would be happy. Then I can serve the Lord. Maybe if I was only safe and my future was taken care of, then I'll be happy. Then I can, then I can serve my neighbor. But no, that's a false sense of glory, a false understanding of glory. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, Bonhoeffer, von Bonhoeffer, those German names, they have all those Vons in there. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran uh, theologian, and ultimately he was killed by the Nazi regime uh, for standing uh, up against them and for, uh, for protecting people who were being persecuted. But he wrote this book called The Cost of Discipleship. And there's a line from that book that I return to over and over again, and you've probably heard Father Michael talk about this before. But if I had my druthers, I would put this on a banner as we were leaving this this church, or even on on the door as we leave your house. You read this line every day and allow it to sink into your heart, to my heart. He says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls us, he bids us come and die. Right? We know the attestation of the martyrs in the church, these men and women who, with their very lives, bled on this earth, gave up their very lives for the truth of the gospel, for the truth of Jesus Christ. And that happened in the very earliest days of the church, and that's happening today. We know these stories and we've seen the atrocities of of what's happened in the Middle East and in China and in parts of, 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 of Asia where men and women have given their very lives because they were following Jesus. They understood the cost of following him and they did that unto death so that even the action of their very death just as Christ's own death was an attestation that God is real, that God is worth it that the call to follow him must be heeded. But we're also called to bid, uh, when Jesus calls us, he bids us come to die in ways that aren't even with our very lives. Right? We are called to come and die to ourselves, die to that pursuit of honor, to that pursuit of pleasure, that pursuit of power, of wealth, of security. Come to die to this false sense of glory. Right? And if you're a parent or if you're a husband or wife, you know this. <laughs> you know what this means. Dying to yourself for another. Dying to your plans, to your desires for your very life in order to lead another closer to heaven. You place someone else in greater importance over you. And that's not hard. That's, sorry, that is hard. <laughs> it's not easy. It's very hard. But all of us and one way or another are called to do that, to die to ourselves, to die to those ways that we seek that false sense of glory. You know, Pope Benedict had a line that I, I find comforting over and over again, because he says, the world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. You were made for greatness. You were made for relationship with Jesus. The very word glory in Hebrew, kavod, means heaviness, greatness. That's what we were made for. We were made for that glory, to participate in that. And so we're called to die to ourselves, 
whether that's even with our very lives or that white martyrdom of that death, that daily death of dying to temptation, of dying to sin. And we even, we have this example of the martyrs and of the saints who showed us how to die, even in the ultimate moment of death, or how to die to, themse- to ourselves over and over again. I've already shared before of my own mother, my own, in my own testimony, of how I witnessed her suffering well, of bearing that cross with Christ, and how she attested to me that God is real, that God is worth it. But I have a more recent example as well. When I was in seminary, um, I had a professor, Father Nicholas Kakia. He was from Malta, from the island of Malta. That's the place where St. Paul shipwrecked. And he always reminded us that he was from a place where St. Paul lived and that we are not because we are silly Americans. Um, but Father Kakia, a very holy man, he had a doctorate in spiritual theology. He taught scripture. He taught wisdom literature, the Psalms. But he also taught me and my, my classmates holy orders, what it means to be a priest, the sacrament of holy orders, how to live out the priesthood. And I'll tell you, he taught me more by the example of his life than any lecture he gave in the classroom. Father Nick, he was um, diagnosed with cancer, with bladder cancer, and he underwent treatments. He'd go to treatment in the morning, and then he'd come back to the seminary in the afternoon and evening, and he would teach with a smile on his face. He'd sit at the dinner table with us, even if he had no appetite, and he would love us, and he would have conversations with us, and he would share his life with us. And ultimately, the cancer came back, and they had to remove his bladder. And I was thinking about this last night, even as I was saying it in the homily, and I think I'm right in this, that he only missed three days of class, so about a week. He had his bladder removed, he had this major surgery, and he came back, and he sat in a chair in front of the class, and he taught us. And I remember thinking, not even understanding the words that he was saying, I was like, this is, a, this is a man who knows Jesus. This is a man who knows how to suffer well. This is a person who has encountered the cross of Christ and has allowed Jesus, who sympathizes us with in, in all of our weaknesses, who has gone before us and suffered in all the ways that we suffer. Here's a man who knows that, who has allowed Jesus to bear that cross with him. And I learned an important lesson from him that day of how to suffer well, because I'm terrible at suffering. We're all terrible at suffering. We don't like it. We don't like it, but that is the cost. We are called to follow Jesus, even unto the cross. Another example of a modern-day martyr, Father, um, let's see if I can find it. Father Andrea Santoro, who's an Italian priest who served in Turkey, and he was assassinated in 2006, he was there serving the people, evangelizing, and trying to catechize the people there. And after his death, after his assassination for the faith, they found in his journal this entry. And Father Santoro says, I am here in Turkey. I am here to dwell among these people and enable Jesus to do so by lending him my flesh. One becomes capable of salvation only by offering one's own flesh. The evil in the world must be born and the pain shared, assimilating it into one's own flesh, as did Jesus. This witness of his very life, this witness of what St. Paul tells us, that we make up for what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Not that anything is imperfect with, with what Jesus did. When he mounted his throne of grace, nothing is imperfect there. But what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ is that he is no longer here on this earth suffering. And that when we suffer in our own lives, or we suffer because of our faith, we are participating in this mystery. That Jesus is allowing us to experience his cross and his redemption. And that's powerful. And we all have these examples of people in our lives, those who have suffered well. People that are sitting in these pews right now to your right and to your left, who have suffered, who have lost a loved one, who are suffering with illness or disease, who are suffering because of their faith, whose family maybe even ridicules them for their very faith. Maybe you are experiencing that yourself. But to know that Jesus, who is our high priest, who is our king, who is our savior, has gone before us. 
that he is on his throne of grace, and he's calling us to approach his throne of grace and asking for that help. And that is what we do today. That is what we do at every Mass. We approach this altar where he gives us his very self. We come before this crucifix, which is his throne, and he calls us to mount that with him, to undergo suffering, not for the sake of suffering, but for our redemption and for the redemption of others. So that is the invitation to us today, to bring whatever suffering, whatever pain, whatever sorrow, whatever illness, whatever struggle that we are going through, and allow Jesus to bear that with us. That this is the cost of discipleship. That when Jesus calls us, he calls us, he bids us to come and die. To die to ourselves, to die to this false sense of glory, and ultimately, maybe, even to die our very selves. So we ask for that grace necessary to grow in holiness, to grow in our journey with Jesus as his disciples as we come and die.